people were in Babylon. Babylon had came and overthrown Jerusalem. Had taken better than 80% of all the people and marched them to Babylon, including Nehemiah. And while he's in Babylon, he becomes the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes. But while he's in the middle years of his assignment, he becomes restless. How many ever now and then you feel a little restless? And suddenly his uh, brother brings him up to date on the conditions of his homeland. He says, man, you won't believe it. The city looks just like Detroit. Uh, uh, uh. How many know what I'm trying to say? He said, the walls are, 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 are totally destroyed and the gates are burned. Uh, the entire economy of Jerusalem had collapsed. Everyone had fled the city. And the only ones that were left were called the remnant. They were the only ones left in the city. And things were so bad in the city, even the 20% left and moved to the suburbs. <laughs> hmm. Did y'all relate to what's going on here? And Nehemiah, does the story sound familiar? Yeah, the twenty percent left the city. So by that time, all the wild animals and the weeds had overgrown like a lot of our neighborhoods. Y'all relate to what's going on here in the book of Nehemiah? Conditions were so bad that Nehemiah did what in verse four? Said it came to pass when he heard. Are you with me? Yeah. He heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Yeah. Can you imagine this man was so broken? His families were scattered, the city was in ruins. The economy was collapsed. He's experiencing a midlife crisis. He has brothers no social life. Come on, talk to me. It don't take a rocket scientist to fill this out, huh? He has no social life, and all of a sudden, he has this revelation that creates a burden. See, whenever you experience a burden for a specific area. Yeah. Uh, could it be an indication that that's where God might be calling you to? Uh, you just really have to be mm, sensitive in the spirit. The things that you despise, things that are broken. Could it be that God is calling you to make him right? And so it was with Nehemiah. God literally began to shake him and make him aware of the magnitude of that city. Yeah. And it's interesting to note that nobody was standing in line to go fix the city. Right. Uh -huh. No one wanted to be mayor of the city of Jerusalem. How many can understand what I'm trying to convey here? But when God places a demand upon your life concerning a specific assignment, you don't have to sit back and try to figure it out. Because God is trying to find someone who he can work it out through. Yeah. Yes. And that's where Nehemiah comes into the picture. And that's where you and I begin this journey. You and I have to figure out what crossroad are we experiencing regarding our own personal crises. Maybe your crisis is not the magnitude of a Nehemiah. Maybe it's much smaller. Maybe you just lost a job. 
Maybe one of your kids has gone wayward. Maybe you just uh, were demoted. Maybe you have experienced a health challenge. And for you in your world, you feel like it's the end of your world. But God, could God be using that as a crossroad to reroute your life and bring you into your destiny? How many are willing to open up and say, God, teach me? Hmm. The psalmist David said, God, try me. Test me. And so it is, is that Nehemiah began to open up to a series of personal tests. A test to see if he could experience success. What test are you encountering tonight that God is setting you up for a higher level of success? What test tonight seems so insurmountable that you would prefer to skip class and not take the test? How many have been there? Mm -hmm. hmm? So God is speaking to you tonight regarding your test. Because you feel the test is so hard, I'm not even going to show up for class. I learned that part of the process in taking a test is just showing up. If you just if you just show up, you never know what is going to happen when you get into the class. Amen. Minister Carter. <laughs> Sometimes you get to class and you discover the test is an open book test. Yeah. <laughs> and that every answer to the test is in the But you would have never known that it was an open book test because you were so fearful of the outcome, you decided not to even participate. I remember when God was reworking my life, reinventing me. And uh, it was a very uncomfortable process. And I remember that I, I said, God, I'm open to a new level, a new season. I opened the marketplace ministry. We were pastoring at the time. And uh, I said, God, I'm open to that whole idea. And uh, not knowing how it would play out, God just starts draw, starts to, how can I describe it? Uh, he just starts to start uh, drying up your river. Have you ever gone through a season where the river was full and all of a sudden it starts drying up? God will use a dried up river to move you all to the next spot where you can find a cold glass of water. <laughs> and I remember that we went through about a 12 month period of where the water was just drying up. And my wife, being the discerner that she is, how many of you women have the gift of discernment? Come on, brothers. I will go to a lot of unnecessary battles and tests because she got the revelation about my own situation. And I would learn to listen. Come on, brother, talk to me. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so, but I remember God was, was preparing to, to shift us like he was with Nehemiah. And, and, and my wife was already three steps ahead of me. And I was saying, well, I will leave this spot. Because wow. some spots are great spots. Yes. But even though I was in a great spot, I wasn't in the moment. In the corporate community, we talk about being in the moment. You go to a boardroom meeting, and they don't want you uh, going through your iPhone or checking your email. They don't, they don't want to say, uh, is everybody present? Uh, is everybody in the moment? And I learned that I was in a good spot, but I wasn't in the And so the question I'm asking you, you might be in a great worship experience in a great church, but are you in the because being in the moment is much, much different than being in a good place. And I remember I was in a, what I call a sweet spot. At that time, I was the chaplain of the Milwaukee Bucks. Pretty sweet gig, right? Uh, back 
back in the day, it was like uh, Glenn Bigdog Robinson, you basketball guys, Ray Allen, Sam I Am Cassell, Tim Thomas, just to name a few. Uh, you know, I was in the locker room with all the guys from the NBA, you know, so all my NBA childhood stars was able to host a, a, a chapter service at the All-Star Game in Atlanta. And so I'm in my zone. Come on, brothers. I'm in my zone. I'm in a sweet spot. And all of a sudden, I felt restless. I said, okay, God. I'll never forget, I took, I think it was uh, either Solomon or Princeton to a game. And God says, get ready, son. I said, for what? Because you're wrapping up your time with the Milwaukee Bucks. Well, I wasn't really happy about that message. <laughs> but I knew what he was saying because the, the river was drying up. And what I wanted to accept the fact or not, the river was drying up. Uh, I had to accept the fact that there wasn't water flowing like it used to flow. Because now that was two signs. My wife was giving me one, the water was giving me another. Come on, talk to me. Somebody understand what I'm trying to say. I had to learn how to get in the moment. Yes. Fast forward it. I remember when God said, okay, this is your last chapel service. The hardest thing in the world. I stood before the guys in the locker room. I said, guys, it's been a great journey. Uh, maybe all six or seven years with the Bucks. Come on. How many would appreciate that opportunity? And uh, my guy said, this is your last night. Tell the guys. I said, well, God, tell them that this is my last night. How about the next day? I'll tell them it's my last night. Well, God wanted me to cut and run. Somebody better get the message on this. He said, but when you let it out of your mouth, when, once you let it out, it's over. Now, you might try to go back for another game, but really, it's over. And I'll never forget that night. I'll never forget that night. It was, I was with Michael Red. Maybe some of you guys remember Michael Red. And, uh, and I said, man, did I just say that, Mike? After the game, we got in this car, you know, driving this big old whatever car. I said, man, something's happening on the inside. I can't even explain it. All I know is that tonight, I said to all the guys, this was my last night. And so fast forward, we finally shift from the pastorate. We moved from Milwaukee to Michigan. Brothers, I, I, I will tell you, I was still <laughs> screaming, kicking, and hollering. But God says, the sooner you get in the moment, the sooner I'll move you on to your destiny. Wow, wow, wow. But it was hard. Come on, I'm just telling you that it was hard. I might have even get to me and buy I'm just telling you my own story. Is that all right? Would that work tonight if I had to just tell my own story? Just like me and my full of tests. And so I remember I was between jobs, which is just a fancy way of saying I was unemployed. <laughs> Unemployed. I mean, for the last almost 25 plus years, my wife and I were gainfully employed, college graduates, had great jobs, combined income. Somebody talk to me. Pastors, you know, we had a beautiful home and a beautiful subdivision. Everything was everything. I was in the moment all the time. But God says, I'm about to shift you. Do you feel this midlife crisis yet? <laughs> We get to Michigan, I must start looking for a job. I must have sent out a hundred thousand, a hundred gazillion <laughs> resumes. Wow. My wife must have been praying, because she always likes what I tell on myself. And nobody responded. And when they did, most times they were like young enough to be my son. And I had to sit there and listen to them, sir, you're just not qualified. So I went through at least six months of that, brothers. I don't know how many trees I cut down to send out resumes. 
how many embarrassing situations I had as I was trying to understand what was God up to. So uh, finally, I landed me a job. Brothers, I was so happy. I mean, come on, brother. When you don't have a job, the Bible says you don't eat. And I'm hungry now. Come on, somebody. I'm hungry. <laughs> so uh, this job, you know how sometimes the job description, when, this, when they list it, it's, it always looks like it's way up here. <laughs> and it looks like it's... You know, you're underqualified. And then they tell you you got the job and say, okay, I'm ready to handle this job. And then they get you in there and then they tell you what the job entails. So they said, I'm going to be a building uh, facilities manager. I said, okay, that means I'm going to oversee, you know, uh, any of the special events. Come on. You know, all the all the events in the uh, facility, I would be overseeing and managing the people, the situations, and everything. And uh, so I get there, brother, and I'm feeling good because now I can bring home the money, right? Man, I tell you, it was probably one of the lowest paying jobs I had since I left high school. I said, God, I don't know exactly what you're doing. But I can hear you now. What you, what you got to say now, God? <laughs> what you got to say now, God? I'm on my ears. He said, but you're, you're close, but you're not close enough. And so I proceeded to go about doing my duties at the job. And the first one, brothers, I was so happy because I was back in my element. I was in a gym. Right? I just left the box. Gym, right? Sweet. But uh, it got kind of flipped the script. I was in a gym, but I was sweeping the gym floor. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight. But I just left six months ago in Milwaukee Bucks, and now I'm sweeping the gym floor at the community center. And I'm walking that floor saying, God, I don't understand, but I'm all ears. Speak, Lord, speak, for thy servant heareth thee. Talk, God, talk. The more I talked, the quieter God got. And so I discovered that, uh, uh, oh, it was like Job. Job had to learn how to find the left hand side of God. Uh, see, most of us are comfortable and confident with the right hand side of God. That's where you know you pray, you fast, you seek your space, and it gives you an answer. But living on the left hand side of God is totally different. You see his face, you fast and pray, uh, you read your Bible night and day, come on somebody. And the more I read, the more I fast and pray. Uh, God, are you even here? About this time, 